I've brought in Associate Professor Stefan Meyer to talk to the class. He's got a background in looking at sensor design and automating processes in terms of extracting data from satellites and airborne systems as well. So he's been at CDU for about five years now and worked with the West Australian Government prior to coming here. And his main background in terms of working in Australia is looking at savannah burning and fire. So for those of you who are interested in looking at fire for your end of semester projects, he's a good person to talk to, so hit him up with your questions. Um, but prior to that, he was at the German Aerospace Centre. So he's got a lot of experience both in Australia and also internationally as well. So it's quite cool that he's coming to talk to you guys today. And he's going to run through some exercises to help you understand a little bit more about pixel size, field of view, swath width, and some of those other terms that we've been using in our practical sessions. Morning, everyone. Um, so as Karen said before, I'm going to talk a bit about sensor types and geometrical characteristics. So first thing, passive active remote sensing systems. I think you already read a little bit about it, but I'm just repeating that. So passive systems, they measure, measure naturally occurring energy or naturally available energy. This energy can be from the sun, it can be from the moon. And then this light in that case interacts with the target. Or another option is the actual energy is emitted by the target itself. So just imagine, for example, a fire and you're looking at a fire. Obviously that fire emits visible radiation, but also thermal radiation. And actually every um, body that has got a temperature that's above the absolute zero emits ra thermal radiation and that can be measured. Um, active systems, on the other hand, they have their own source of energy, usually light energy, that gets emitted, interacts with the target, and then gets detected by the actual sensor. Any questions to that? All right, so you ready to go through some examples? <laughs> you and I, what's that, active or passive? Yeah. Digital camera. Yeah, exactly. With a flash? That's active. Yeah. Landsat? Heard about Landsat ETM? That's a passive sensor, exactly. Radar? Yep. A depth sounder. Doesn't use light, but sound. That's an active system, yeah. A thermal camera? Yep. A satellite? Oh, the satellite isn't necessarily a, a sensor. The satellite is really a platform that can carry a, a remote sensing system. So that's a bit of a tricky one. <laughs> LiDAR? Yep. Human with a torch walking around at night? <laughs> Active, yes. <laughs> um, another satellite sensor? Yep. Good. Oh. All right, sensor types. That's a bit more difficult, this one. So we basically have three different sensor types. The first one, I don't know why it goes blank all the time with that one, is a frame camera. Now, the characteristic of a frame camera is it captures the whole image at once. Now, this can be a digital system. It can also be an analog system. Just think about an old camera with a film. It takes the whole image in one go. But modern digital cameras, obviously they're digital, they also take the whole frame in one go. So that's the characteristic of a frame camera. It's relatively rarely used with remote sensing systems on airborne or, or spaceborne remote sensing systems. But there are some, some systems that use that. Push boom. Scanner, well, as the name says, it sort of captures a line at a time, and through the movement of, of the sensor, it builds up the whole image. Yeah? And then a third variety is a so-called WISP room. 
scanner. It always captures one pixel at a time and sort of sweeps across the image and through the movement forward of the sensor it captures the whole image again. So these are the most used types of sensors um, in remote sensing. This type of, of sensor is used for usually for digital aerial photography in many cases, although things are moving towards the other sensor systems. <clears throat> and I'm only aware of one satellite sensor really that, that has got a setup like that. And it's called Polder. Well, to, to capture the whole image in that case because the sensor is moving along. I mean, you, just like it does to scan. Yeah, and for, for this one it needs really a mirror that does that sweep across and that's actually one of the disadvantages of that sensor because you have to have something mechanical that's moving and everything mechanical can wear out. On a plane that's not, not such a drama but on a satellite that's a serious issue. That's why the tendency goes sort of towards this one. Um, it also has another advantage because it basically has, has to have a, a sensor for every single pixel. That also means that sensor looks at that pixel for a longer time, each of these sensors, because they don't have to cover the whole line. On the other hand, if you have multiple sensors, they're all slightly differently, di different, so you have to calibrate them very well so they really see the same thing, have the same sensitivity and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, and that obviously the problem, different sensitivity between different sensors is not an issue here, but you have got that mechanical scanning issue. Okay, any more questions regarding these sensor types? No? All right. Um, then a few terms that we regularly use in remote sensing that characterize the sensor. This one is swath width. Anyone know what that is? So it, it's basically the image width. So I'll just try to illustrate that through that. Um, field of view, it's the angle. Um, the next one, pixel size, it's very obvious. Um, instantaneous field of view. Look at the name, it still has got that field of view. It just has got that instantaneous, sorry? Exactly, yeah, it's again that angle, but in this case just for the pixel itself. Yeah. All right, now that we've sort of defined these terms, um, we're going to try to measure them. And that's why we ask you to bring a digital camera. And we want you to determine swath width or image width, field of view, pixel size, and instantaneous field of view. Any ideas how you could do that with a, for a digital camera? Yeah, so I, I set these distances. So I, I want you to do it for two distances. And if you then do that, please don't change the zoom for your camera. Because when you change the zoom, you obviously change these parameters. So how would you go about it? How would you measure, let's say, swath width? So what we do is we take a tape measure, <laughs> something like that. Um, we've got our camera, and we just take a photo of that tape measure and see how much the camera can see. And that should give us uh, the swath. Now, if we got that, how do we get the field of view? Yep, so we know that distance here. That angle is the field of view. And then obviously that's just a bit of trigonometry. And if the computer comes up, I don't have to write down the formula. <laughs> I do it anyway, so tangent of the half that angle equals 
squad. And then obviously you can resolve that for field of view. Um, peaks and size. How do you go about that? Not on the sensor, not yeah. on the on the target. So on the on the ground, if you got a remote yeah. sensing system. So it's like the swath by the number of pixels. Yep. Or you can take any any length. Yeah. Might be easier. Yeah. And then again, instantaneous field of view. Once you got a pixel size, straightforward, same as that. Now, all these calculations, that's quite important, especially if you want to um, fly an airborne sensor, and you want to, usually your application determines what pixel size you want to get. Um, and that means you have to calculate how high you have to fly your sensor. There are some other restrictions in terms of how fast the, the plane can go, and things like that, but that, we don't talk about that here. What's quite often done is um, there's actually a frame camera sitting on in the system, and instead of one direction is distance on the ground, it's the wavelength that changes. So for hyperspectral sensor, they usually have like a frame chip, and in one direction it's it's a cross track, the pixels are cross track, and the other direction is is the wavelength. So it this type of sensor is becoming more common these days. I think Landsat 8 is a push broom scanner as well, whereas the older Landsats, they always have been whisk broom scanners, um, which actually caused some of the problems. You might have heard of the scanline corrector issue on Landsat 7. So Landsat 7 imagery is well, degraded, it looks really weird on the edges, and that's because a mechanical component has failed that is related to that scanning optics. And I guess that probably was one of the motivations of going to a push broom scanner. Because you've got no mechanics, they can't fail. And obviously mechanics, they also use more power, usually. Um, to get to 30 centimeter pixels, um, you have to be quite close, so about a kilometer or so. Um, usually planes, you want to fly them a bit higher most of the time because it's more stable, the plane is more stable, it's not moving around as much. Therefore they need slightly different optics. Um, that requires a bit more space. It's also, they do want to get more light into the system so the opening aperture of the optics needs to be a bit bigger. But a typical um, airborne sensor, even hyperspectral sensor these days, is probably a box like that. Um, similar on the satellites. Usually that's sort of what you can afford. To. I was talking about the chip. The chip itself, well, there are small ones, like in, in digital cameras. Um, quite often these are actually the same chips that are in digital cameras. With um, whisk broom scanners, which don't have um, a chip in there, they often have, have for example, MODIS, they've got photodiodes for every band. Um, they are just assembled in, in small arrays. <coughs> so we're not talking about huge things. What they sometimes do to in increase the, the number of pixels is they assemble multiple chips together. I know colleagues, when I worked at DLR, colleagues were working on a camera for a Mars um, sensor, and they assembled, I think, five chips together to, to capture that. Similar, yeah, Mary's the European sensor. I think they've got basically five chips put together and, and sort of have five cameras that are using the same optics.